Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Great. My name is Trina Shanks. I'm Director of Community Engagement and a professor here at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Today I'm wearing glasses, a black blazer, a rust shirt, and a black and rust skirt, even though you can't see it. Um, if you um, want to get the closed captioning, you can hit CC and um, but show subtitles so you can see the words across the screen as people are talking. If you um, go in the upper right corner um, and toggle between gallery view or speaker view, you can see the PowerPoint slide and the person who's talking. But really, all I get to do today is to tell you that we're going to have an incredible session. We're going to talk about the use of art for social change and to express ideas and values and galvanize social change movements. Um, and for those who are in the engaged community class and our panelists, make sure you stay on for a few minutes um, to debrief after the formal presentation. So next slide, please. We always start with a, a land and labor acknowledgement. Um, Engage is aware that we function in a society that has a deep history of exploitation, stealing of land and labor, and it's affected both indigenous and black communities for generations. So we always want to acknowledge this um, in everything we do and hope that our work helps lead to a more inclusive tomorrow. So let's take a few minutes to read this land and labor acknowledgement. Thanks so much. Now I'd like to induce, introduce our engaged team. Next slide, please. There's lots of us to work together to make these wonderful webinars happen. And next slide, so I can tell you who they are, but I know them, so if the slide doesn't come up, I'll mention the names anyways. <laughs> so um, Sonia Harb, um, um, there she is, is our Detroit Engagement Specialist. Aisha Ghazi Edwin helps coordinate this class, but is also our engaged program manager and adjunct le lecturer. Fatima isn't here today, but she's our program manager. And then we have three wonderful interns, Leslie Long, Cleo Walsh, and Annika Sproul. And so if you want to look at any past session that we've done, um, or in a week or so, see this recording, you can go to our website, which is listed here on the page. And I think we will, someone will put it in the chat. Next slide, please. So this session today is going to be moderated by another faculty at the School of Social Work and my friend and colleague, Rogerio Pinto. Um, he's Associate Dean for Research and Innovation of the School of Social Work and also a professor of theater and drama of the School of Music, Theater and Dance. He spearheads the School of Social Work's art-based social justice collective and has done various initiatives in the school and community connecting social work to the arts, including for our centennial celebration, his own performance of Realm of the Dead, which I was able to attend and was an incredible um, multimedia experience. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pinto and I'm handing it off to you. Thank you, Trina, so much for the very nice introduction. Uh, I always like to be around Trina because you always look good uh, around Trina because she is fabulous uh, and we all know this. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with, with your team uh, and I will acknowledge, you know, the team a little more, um, you know, toward the end. Uh, so as T uh, Trina, you know, told you guys, I am a professor at the School of Social Work and I am uh, the Associate Dean for Research and Innovation. And with that innovation title, there comes a lot of ideas, right? And one of them uh, is the idea of how to use our practices to advance uh, social justice. Uh, as a practitioner, uh, meaning not social work practitioner, but as an art making practitioner and also uh, a performer uh, and, and someone who actually is doing research to illuminate how uh, social justice advancement through the arts uh, may actually be evaluated in ways that are ethical and do not put pressure on the people who are actually producing uh, the art that they are producing. I am absolutely thrilled uh, to be here with Satori Shakur and Gary Anderson, who will get to know uh, really well in the next hour or so. Uh, it is really uh, incredibly uh, an incredible opportunity. Uh, I have, you know, big gray hair and I wear glasses. Uh, I'm wearing, you know, a turtleneck that is about like a beige kind of color. Uh, the accent is 
my original accent uh, from Brazil, where I grew up. Uh, I go by he and him. Uh, it's how I identify myself. And before I get to our guests, which is the most you know fascinating portion of this uh, of this session, I just want to you know ask you stop for a moment and think about how important the arts are and how they have been in our lives. And to begin to think about the arts in really creative ways, right? I mean, not only the things we see in museums and the music that comes through, you know, on the radio, but art as we perceive in the day to day, uh, the things that we create uh, in our lives. Uh, and of course, the gigantic, incredible things that may happen on a stage, like in the Met and a big opera, but really to think about art being this thing that is much more attainable when we think about something that is close to us. Uh, and it is based on the power of that connection between us as individuals uh, and art practices uh, that the inspiration to have an art collective in the school and to have these kinds of conversations that we are having now uh, came about. Uh, trying to elucidate for us, uh, because you know I, I feel like a student of this every day of my life, so, but it's, so it's, it is to illuminate for us, the people who are actually on the panel, but also to illuminate for others who may be thinking, uh, you know, about how we can use art practices to advance issues related to social justice. So it is uh, with incredible pleasure that I introduce uh, Satori Shakur, who is the executive director of the Detroit-based organization that has the most fascinating name, the Secret Society of Twisted, storytellers. I want to have membership in that society yesterday. Um, so, and the second person is Gary Anderson, uh, who is the producing artistic director of Plowshares Theater. And they will themselves uh, tell you more details about them uh, instead of me, you know, letting you know the kinds of things that they do. Uh, I will let them go first, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, what it is that we are trying to do in the school very quickly, and then we will just have a conversation about all kinds of topics. Uh, I encourage all of us uh, to go to chat, ask questions, make comments, let's make this as uh, interactive as possible. So without further ado, may I ask you, Satori, to introduce yourself and give us you know, the major things that you think we should know about you. Many other things will come as we go on with the conversation, of course. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's my honor and pleasure. Uh, my name is Satori Shakur, and I am an artist, and I identify as a human being. Uh, I am uh, committed and dedicated to the arts, and I am trained uh, to create projects that lead to transformation in community. So wherever I have lived, and I've lived many places, Hawaii, California, Toronto, and then Detroit, I have left um, a theater company. I founded a, helped to found a theater company in Toronto. When I was in Los Angeles, I founded the Black Avant Garde, which was a collection of artists, poets, painters. And we were all organized around um, the time that Rodney King was beaten to a pulp. So we were programmed around the city. We took over Highway Magazine and other spaces to talk about the, what had happened and to lend our voices to seeking and forwarding justice. When I lived in Hawaii, I had a TV show called uh, Satori's Tea Room where I would collaborate and bring on people from the community so, people, so we could introduce people to each other. And that's what I do with the Secret Society of Twits of Storytellers One Story at a Time. We have a global mission to connect humanity, heal and transform community, and to provide an uplifting, thought-provoking, soul-cleansing entertainment experience through the art and craft of storytellers. storytelling. I curate four storytellers each month to tell true and personal stories on a pre-selected curatorial theme. We also have singing, uh, musical performance and dance performances, because that's all part of uh, storytelling. And uh, as in the process of uh, coaching people to tell stories, to tell their own stories, because everybody has a great story, everybody does not know how to tell their story. So um, that's what I do. I design and facilitate storytelling workshops and teach people how to 
communicate because storytelling is the most effective delivery system of information and ideas. So we do this on a monthly basis. We just came back in February uh, to do Black History Month at the city of Southfield. And we opened again at the Mary Grove Theater last month, March 25th, with a show called Love Hurts. We sold out. And we're looking forward to April 15th next week. So if you're here, come on through for Testify. We have four fire-breathing dragon men who are going to testify to their uh, stories. And uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, what I, what I, a little bit, a little overview of what I do. And as we go through the, the program this uh, afternoon, uh, I'm sure that uh, there'll be more that I can share with you. So I know there will be a lot more uh, to share, but this is a great beginning. It gives us, you know, like a very, very round understanding as where you have been and, and where you are now. Uh, and, and what comes up for me more than anything is a very clear commitment uh, to a particular way uh, of uh, creating community organizing a very specific you know, way and I it's one of those things where i feel like wherever you put down roots like you'll learn the both uh the strengths and the weaknesses of that ecosystem or that structure and so thank you i'm uh, losing we, you i'm losing you laura we will open question. up for others uh oh, later okay. on but I, I i would like to go through the program first uh before we do that uh, because I want to hear from from Gary, you know, like a, a you know, like a synopsis, a, you know, the kinds of things that you have been doing and what it is you're doing now. Thank you. So I'm Gary Anderson, producer and artistic director of Plowshares Theatre Company. Plowshares has been around since 1989. We are the oldest, longest lasting black theater company in the state of Michigan. And that's a distinction that I'll be able to articulate. Um, more specifically. A number of the things that Satori said are actually part of the mission of Plowshares in regards to being a storyteller. We consider Plowshares the griot for the city of Detroit. We have traditionally, since the beginning, helped to cultivate generations of actors, directors, designers, and playwrights, providing them with a forum where they can tell their story unfiltered and uncompromised but that story being one from the Black experience. We think it is critically important that African-Americans be able to present their lives on stage, both as a healing capacity, but also in regards to education and illumination. We are two years after this pandemic started, and we saw a lot of things about this country and the conditions that we were living under. We learn, some people learn things that they did not know and other people had things that they believed confirmed by the activities. Two years after 15 million people went into the streets to declare that Black Lives Matter, a year after we finally acknowledged the horrors that had been inflicted on the citizens in Tulsa in 1921, this year we have seen state after state pass laws that make it illegal to tell the truth about the American history. We've talked about fond people talking about people who are discomforted by the realities that exist in it when this country has not lived up to the ideals and principles that it claims to be for. And it's incumbent now more than any other time in our history for theater artists, artists of all type to step up and stand in the gap. If we're not gonna hear those stories told to us in our educational institutions, if we're not gonna see it addressed in our legal systems or in our social, social environments, the artist has to step, step up and present themselves. And that's actually what Plowshares does. The, we're in the process of presenting the first play we've done in two years, a new musical that's been developed by Detroiters, about Detroiters called Hastings Street. And that piece is actually ripped from the history of the city. Some of you may have already heard about the fact that um, there was a segregated community called Black Bottom that existed and that it was torn down to make way for 375. 
we're going to tell the story of the beginning of that change when the tensions existed in regards to many people within the community trying to retain their residencies, their businesses. And the idea behind this is that we know how the story plays out. But what we're really going to do is focus on the community, the community being specifically focused in the one family that we watch their adventures. We're using this framework to talk about economic equity because right now Detroit's going through another phase of economic development. And what we're seeing is that a good number of the people who look like they're gonna benefit don't look like the people who've been living in the city for the last 30 or 40 years. And so we saw how in the past, economic development and progress was targeting people of color and how that has played out. In fact, the very fabric of where Detroit is today is greatly influenced by the events of destroying Black Bottom. And so we, so to, so to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes again, we're using this play, we're partnering with other organizations in a desire to actually make people aware of how we need to be, be cognizant and act, activate to make sure that we don't let those things occur and harm the current residents because we should learn some stuff. We should learn a lot of things and pay attention. And so the arts are, for us, the way in which we do that. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for you know all that you said. And I mean, we, we can begin to see a conversation already, right? In terms of the mm -hmm. values that are holding the two of you together, the, the values that are uh, being used to create principles that probably guide the behavior of your organizations, what it is you produce, who, who gets produced, and who creates uh, what it is that we see. I'm going to suggest that we uh, unshare the, the slides so that we, we have more space for, for people so that we can see uh, everyone. And I'm going to uh, encourage as many people as possible to actually show uh, you know, to use the video function, it's a lot easier and a lot nicer to be talking to people that we can see. Uh, we, of course, understand that some people may not be able to do that for whatever reason. Uh, but as a facilitator of the conversation, I would love to see more faces, if at all possible. Uh, and I think that Satori and Gary would probably uh, appreciate that as well. Um, one thing that came up for me listening to this is like, why do I do the things that I do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a dictatorship uh, in Brazil. My entire, the first 20 years of my life uh, were under the dictatorship where the only uh, access that we had to some reality was through music and through dance and through, because the television channels were all dominated by the dictatorship in Brazil. And so art became like a way of communicating things that were not being communicated in the school or by anybody else, going back to what Gary said, right? So we are at a, at a, at a moment in our existence that we do need very creative ways to convey information that is not being conveyed uh, in other ways. Uh, information that has not been conveyed before, it's just that now, I mean, to imagine that the entire South of the United States was really talking about a critical consciousness, you know, any time in the past, it's untrue. So it's like this whole idea of actually, let's stop people from talking about these things in school, uh, when we know many of the things that are taught in, in and, and I'm not just like picking on the South, right? But a lot of those laws are coming out of places in there, but it's, it's, it's moving up in the country as well. I think my, the main point that I'm saying is that uh, artists have, uh, have been able to say things sometimes in ways that speak to our gut, to our soul in ways that, that then uh, they can say those things, make the points that they want to make without being prosecuted, going to jail, exiled, right? Where it, which those things can happen uh, very often in places where, uh, such as the place where I grew up. Uh, so this is one of the things that actually inspire me to think about arts in, in a way of advancing social justice and helping people understand and talk more about uh, what it is that it means to them. And, and it is something that's very close to social work in the history of social work, uh, which is not very long. It's just a, you know, a, a little more than 100 years old. Uh, social workers, by and large, have been concerned about the, the using art practices to help students uh, understand 
their positionalities and understand their responsibilities as social workers. Uh, and we also have used art practices to do research uh, as well. And this is how it all comes together in a school of social work and the conversation that, that we are already having today. Uh, the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan has been very interested in these issues for at least uh, one, you know, one decade where it became much more specific in terms of like, what are we gonna do to bring more uh, art-based practices to the school? And we have a beautiful collection uh, with you know, over 70 pieces that everybody's welcome to come and look at it in the building. And we are growing our, our, our faculty uh, the, you know, many of us who do performance work, same, some of them are here. Uh, Ashley Curriton is one of them, and Trina Shanks is another one of them who did a play last year as well. I am another, Richard, Rich Toma, uh, Toman, and there are many other of us who have individually been creating, you know, uh, artwork but you know, isolated and unable to actually create a community. And I would like the two of you to help me understand and inspire us as to how you do it, because in many ways is what I heard you guys uh, are doing. And I would like to start by asking, as we move in that, that direction, to help me define art. What is art? Because we, you know, I said that the word many times, you guys use that as well, but I think it's important not to define as like a definitive thing, but as a thing that we can, uh, you know, refer back to in the conversation that we are about to have. Uh, so any, any, any ideas and people could go to the, to the chat and say what it is that they think art is or art practices. Um, so Satori, any words or two or, or, or sentences uh, about, you know, what is art? Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, you discover what art is. You discover what art is and, you be, and as an artist, you are already shaped to be a social justice warrior because there are no infrastructures in place that support artists per se. It's not a respectable, you know, field when I was growing up uh, and being black and female, there were just obstacles that, and I didn't know that there was some system, this invisible system of what they call oppression. I just knew that for me, I would see, I would have visions. I would see something that other people couldn't see because it didn't exist yet. And that for me, it was about bringing what I saw into existence so other people could see it so other people could share it. So to me, art is, is, is your vision of the world and how you want to see the world, what's missing from the world that you want to bring into the world. And nobody gets to say what art is. When I lived in Los Angeles, there was the fine art world and there were people who sat in lofty towers and determined what was art and how much what something was worth and who could be that person to receive. And I was encouraging artists, take your art on the street, march it around. You don't have to wait for a gallery to invite you, you know? So for me, um, art is your passion, your vision, the thing that is missing for you in the world that you are willing to use your life to bring into existence. You midwife your vision or mid-husband your vision. You know, mm. to be. It, it, it sounds also that, you know, you, you, what, what I'm getting from you well, many things, but one in particular is art as a process. That it's not, you know, the outcome of a whole thing, but it's 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 the process that may lead to something as well. And I wonder, you know, what are your thoughts about that, Gary? Well, you know, I I, I teach, so I tell my students that we actually all are born artists, and what happens is the way we educate and the way we raise up children beats that out of them. Because if you really look at the ability of a child to imagine and create things out of nothing, to entertain themselves with a box, not the toy that came in the box, but the box, you see the capacity for creation and imagination and innovation. And I think that that's really what um, inspires it. I do believe that it is your individual idea coming up forward. But I think art is, 
Art is our way of actually presenting our own interpretation of the world in which we live and the things that we see and presenting that so that it's not just self-satisfaction. It's really about trying to engage others in the same conversation that we're going through internally. Um, we use the arts as a method by which we transmit messages and ideas and we look for those people who resonate with those ideas. Um, and I think that's that's the best way I can characterize it. I, I do, I honestly do believe it. In fact, every time I talk to um, young arts, young theater students, young mu musical theater students, I'm always reminding them of what they did when they were three, four, and five before they got into a system that allowed them to think more, um, socially not necessarily socially but 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 programmically in regards to how they're supposed to behave or in how they were supposed to participate in this exchange and um, i think the more if we went back to the way we used to be when we were younger we were under the age of seven we'd be a lot better off in this world it sounds like from the two of you, the way you're talking is so I, I'm beginning to think right I mean, and, and, and I, it's not news to me, but it's like a, a form of rebellion as well, right? If we think of artistic practices uh, that can help us transcend ourselves, I think Satori, you know, we spoke about that a little bit. Uh, and, 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 well, well and, you mentioned that, you mentioned that, Rodrigo, that you came from Brazil, you, meant you came from a dictatorship. My ancestors, Satori's ancestors, have been in a dictatorship of some form, some form of authoritarian system in this country since we first set foot on the shores. Um, and that tension, that energy, actually, one of the things it does inspire is the creation of art and in many different forms, the Negro spirituals, the dances that we created, quilt making. Um, the approach that we took to a whole host of ways of bringing something out that was inspired in large part by the oppressive um, enslavement that we endured, and then Jim Crow after that, and then all the segregation and everything that we've existed in since then. Our art has been forged in large part by the circumstances that we've been engaged with. And, and, and part of that tradition is the storytelling, since you know the, the documentation of that reality was forbidden, right, uh, or mm -hmm. extremely difficult to 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 mm -hmm. to come forward. Uh, while at the same time, white people were creating that history that was not really necessarily the same uh, history that black people were, were living at the time and even today, right? I mean, there's this there's this enormous um, difference of perception in how one writes history. Uh, and, and I think that then as, as a form of art practice, storytelling comes along uh, as a way, you know, to, 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 to tell stories. And so I, I, and I think of any kind of art, but, and I want to now concentrate a little more on storytelling because uh, it is, you know, a lot of what Satori does and it's what a lot of performance artists do. Uh, is to tell these, you know, stories. Uh, so I, I, you know, for the whole group to 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 think about in terms of art practices uh, as uh, processes all, that can that can help hurt. us to uh, describe things that sometimes are not being described by the mainstream, right? Or to explain phenomenon uh, that is happening inside of our communities that people are not paying attention. Right, like you, you just very eloquently described, Gary, uh, or even to predict what the future may hold if we if we stay the way we are, right? So that this uh, art practices and products can come uh, to do all of those things, and and storytelling being one of them. So I would love for us to now concentrate a little on storytelling and performance uh, as two major things that we can use to advance um, the description of what it is that our lives are, uh, things that we can use as uh, explanations and predictors of how our lives may look in the future. Uh, how does that sound to you, Satori? 
I mean, that's, that sounds good to me. I'm a storyteller. I come from a long line of storytellers, old black women from the Jim Crow, Alabama, Mississippi South. They were uneducated. Uh, they, some of them were educated. They had high school educations, but they mostly, uh, my mother picked cotton, so she didn't attend school when she got to Detroit, the Black Bottom Gary. She had completed ninth grade. She went to Barber Junior High, and uh, she felt uh, she didn't feel good about it because she was older than the other kids. So she quickly got out and became a domestic worker, which was one of the, the uh, professions that, you know, Black people were limited to. Um, so they, they were masters and PhDs in storytelling because when they spoke, it created a movie in my mind. There are stories that they told me that I still remember now, and I share all of you on, on this, uh, in this seminar, remember stories you were told as a child, uh, and they have grown up with you. So that's the power of it, that, that something can be instilled in you from a child, you never forget it. And then the stories that you hear during, throughout your life, once you hear it, they become, you own the, those stories. They become something that nourishes you, something you can learn for, learn with. So the purpose of the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers is for anyone. You don't have to be a so-called artist, a theater actor, which I am, I'm a theater artist. And I told other people's stories for years and years, and I still love doing that. However, to tell your own story, to not need a validation, not need anything except your own life experience and the wisdom that you gain from living that life that you can that you can share in a story for me is profound mm -hmm. i mean for me to work with storytellers every month over the last 10 years that we've been doing this has is 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 a gift to me because i i get to look inside of different cultures different experiences and 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 provide the first audience for the storyteller before they go on stage because telling your own story uh, and then even speaking publicly is terrifying. It's human beings number one fear. So there's a, there's there is a, an act of resistance, you know, when you go to tell your story, but you're actually giving a gift to the listeners. And I believe that the soulmate of the storyteller is the story listener, which equals the audience. Mm -hmm. But listening for me is a revolutionary act because it's voluntary. No one can make you listen. No one can force you to, to listen. You can hear stuff, but to actually engage in the, in the, the activity of listening requires something. And, it, what, and what you have to do is give up something, which is to grant being to someone else's experience. And at the highest level, I do believe that listening is love. And in, and in listening to someone else's story to, to connect with their humanity is actually uh, the ability to expand your own self. And in expanding yourself, you become more inclusive of others. And in becoming more inclusive for others, then you get to live in a world that the possibility of a world that works for everyone with no one and nothing left out. Mm -hmm. So my story that I'm telling, the story that I'm telling now in the places that I'm invited to speak, I tell the story of what I've distinguished as the chip. And I believe that the chip is a program that all of us are instilled with since birth. And depending on your race, creed, class, color, wherever you lived in the world, it uses us. It uses us to perpetuate the system. And there's no other better word. I, and if someone invents one, this institution, this system of white supremacy, which isn't about white people or individuals. It's about all of us. All of us perpetu perpetuate this idea. Um, maybe we know it, maybe we don't, but we are perpetuating in, in what we don't say, how we do, well, how we think, how we keep it in place. And so uh, for me, it's very terrifying to go out and tell those stories. But what happens for me is that I don't make anybody wrong. White people aren't wrong. Black people aren't wrong. You're chippetized. And until you dismantle that, become aware of it, can, can, can in the moment see how you're being used by this system, 
there won't be any correction. There'll be blame and pointing to in the same story about how well the system works, but how in your own individual life are you dismantling this thing so that you can speak and say and do something that's revolutionary, something that will, will I don't even wanna say destroy because one, once you understand you are not free, then you yearn for that. And in yearning for that, then you go over here to acquire it. And then whatever this is over here, it doesn't have any allure. It doesn't have any fascination for you because you wanna live in a better world, a world that works. So after George Floyd's execution, something happened during COVID. These two things changed the way I saw the world because I thought I understood white supremacy. You know, I'd met Neely Fuller Jr. I'd met so many political activists, historians, intellectuals while I was uh, at Milana Karanga Center in Los Angeles for years. I heard them speak. I thought I knew it and understood it intellectually, but I didn't until George Floyd was executed and the world changed and people started to see and that I could engage uh, with people around this conversation and have it be open and not, you're a racist. Yeah, you might. You we're all racist, you know. If you want to put it like that, because if you turn no, that on not, yourself, we're not all. We're well, not so, so, and so, I say, ra- I don't want to. No, I, when we're I say racist, racist, wait, yep. Yeah, when I say all, when I say we're all racist, and please, I don't want to get into any kind of discussion about how black people can't be racist because of that. I'm talking okay, about. Well, we don't have to go there then. No, we're not going there because I already okay. understand that. I get that. What I'm talking about is the chip, how we're used to perpetuate racism. And until you can click into it, uh, you won't see it. Like, I I don't know whether I should continue to talk or- or Let let, let me, so I I would like to do, Sator, is to unpack some of the points you made because you made very powerful, uh, many. We can't unpack all of them, but I would love to unpack a few of them. Uh, so one of them is the power of storytelling uh, as a tool of emancipation, is what I heard you saying. Yeah. Uh, and then a, a tool of transformation as well. Yes. And then Absolutely. when I hear storytelling as a tool of transformation, it is one that requires uh, one to go beyond the individual, perhaps, or telling oneself one's story. Uh, in performing uh, the storytelling. And that changes, right? The way we, we, we think about it. Uh, and perhaps it is in the performance that we might find a space for community organizing and perhaps uh, for changing some of the structural issues that you, you know, very eloquently talked about in terms of racism and white supremacy. Uh, and many of the, the the complications that may come from it. Uh, and But I also want to honor what Gary's reaction was, uh, because, you know, nowadays uh, we do not all think the same way. What I, what I heard more than anything from Satori is that we all have a role in perpetuating racism. Uh, I think that that was very clear, uh, you know, from what you said. Now, whether or not that translates into a group of individuals being, uh, you know, racist or not, maybe we can take that up a little later, Gary, because I think it is important to go back there. But for the moment, what I would love for us to do, if you could build on what Satori talked about in terms of storytelling, and how does that get performed? Uh, You know, how do we see that in the theater and how that actually could be uh, an instrument for emancipation as we begin to talk to more people. So I'll talk about two historic events that actually have a connection. So back on the continent, West African cultures were built on oral traditions. Um, One of the reasons why we don't have texts, so many texts in African community, you know, coming from Kenya or or, Ghana or some of the other West African culture is because in many cases they put the responsibility of those of, of keeping those stories and that history a lot in the embodiment of the jolly or when the French came in they call, called Magria. Mm-hmm. That was an oral historian responsible for retaining all this information. And that was a person, a storyteller 
that had a great deal of importance within the culture of many of these West African communities. They were as important as, as someone with some kind of leadership responsibility because they used the stories of the events of the ancestors to teach the next generation the values and virtues, those things that mattered. And so you may tell the story, retell the story of a hunt where the griot would take on not just the role of the hunter, but also of the of the, the beast that they were chasing. And that story would be designed on evoking some kind of ideal that was important. So that's that's the foundation of storytelling in regards from an African perspective. Jumping here to the to the to the country. The first time a black character react was actually on stage wasn't written by a black person, written by white people. And so the character, the mischaracterization of black people began before we actually had freedom in this country, before emancipation had occurred. And so there, when we were finally released um, and into a segregated and restricted lifestyle. We still try to find, find ways of using the theater, using storytelling as a way of, of correcting that. And it wasn't until in any strong formal sense until 1926 with W.B. Du Bois when he was the editor of, of the crisis magazine for the NAACP. He put out a call to, to action by writers all across this country to create little Negro theaters everywhere there were small communities that exist for mm -hmm. large pockets of community. So you had, you had several in New York, you had one in DC, you had Detroit, Chicago, all across this country. These community of writers and actors that came together to create these little Negro theaters so that they could tell the stories of the people that exist there and present for them the perspective that would not be seen any other way. They were there as a corrective to that stereotypical depiction that was developed in minstrel shows of African-Americans that was now the general affair that we would see presented in our entertainment that would eventually become multifold when we moved into movies and television because these stereotypes still exist with us today. Every time a Black person actually sits down and writes a story, they are one at one point trying to address those stereotypes that they've also been exposed to. And at the same time, trying to speak some level of truth that is presented in authenticity. That's a challenge that constantly is presented by writers, whether they're writing poems or plays or novels, or short stories or songs. The idea is that the storytelling component is part of the, the major component of the resistance that's being presented. And it's also a corrective. That's what's really at the heart of it. It's trying to heal from past injuries that have been perpetrated. It's trying to correct the, the strata. So you now understand that the history that you've been presented has been a false or, or misinformed story that you've heard. Mm -hmm. So we try to correct the narrative. And that's really, in large part, what Du Bois actually helped set down because he saw those little Negro theaters as a way of doing social change. They could become active. And, in, and to be honest with you, the byproduct of that campaign that he did in 1926, you can see in the development of works by writers that eventually got to Broadway, like Lorraine Hansberry or Alice Childress. You can see it in the program, the civil rights activity of groups in the 1960s. N many of the black theaters that, ex that grew up through the 1960s and early 70s were following in that same tradition that had been set down in 1926. So you see what I'm saying? I mean, yes, you and, 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 understand and, that. Well, and, and, and the idea that the, the perhaps emancipation comes from the correction of the of the records right yep. uh, that's yep. that's the, the step you know to to emancipation uh, we have been focusing on storytelling in a way that is like you know very much about oral histories which is 
uh, something that is present in just about any community, right? Uh, no matter what the, the, the person's race is, you know, families tell, you know, stories, hide mm -hmm. some issues about their own lives, right? Uh, it, they reveal more or less to, to, to the, their offspring. Uh, and so the, the, the idea of telling a story to your offspring or, or to, uh, or to tell stories within a family is a little different from what it is that I'm hearing, right? I mean, and I would like for us to make that distinction uh, because it is a very different thing to be someone who is part of the majority, whose stories that are being told outside of the home reflect what it is that is happening inside of the home. And many times for people who are not uh, of majority groups, the stories that are competing uh, usually are not the true uh, and people are creating those stories instead of allowing the people who are actually experiencing those things to have their own stories like Gary uh, just talked about. But I feel that the way we are talking about is very orally oriented. Uh, and I do want us to be aware. And, and then my question is, if someone has an accent like I do, what do I do to tell my story in a country uh, that accepted me, has made me an immigrant, but it doesn't really celebrate me every every step of the way, right? Uh, it, 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 you know, what happens to the person from South America or other places whose stories are not being told because we have accents and we are shy about them? What about people who cannot tell the story but they can sign, you know, the stories that they that they have? I just want to bring that into the conversation to expand. Uh, the understanding of what we are talking about in terms of storytelling and how they get performed by understanding different ways uh, of doing it. Uh, any thoughts, Satori? I'm not sure that I understand your question. Are you saying, are you, you mean like dance? Dance, movement, uh, movement uh, you know, visual art. I mean, that, that I'm, what I'm trying to bring to the picture is that, you know, there might be many different ways of telling a story uh, and performing uh, that is more or different from just orally telling the story. Oh, yeah. So I, as I said, at the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers, we always have dance performance a musical performance. We also have a digital art that we share on our, on our film, on our screen. So we, we try to bring all as many forms of storytelling to our uh, show as possible, featuring different uh, artists from Detroit, people emerging and seasoned. Uh, the, your high school, do, your daughter who has a, do, doing a dance recital or your son that's in the band, we bring them to the stage because maybe the mothers and the fathers see those children, but the, our audience that comes there would never see them, see them and, can, and they can get extra in, encouragement. So movement is very powerful. I host um, for Detroit Public Television, PBS, Detroit performs live for Mary Grove. And I just finished filming five episodes that are coming up. And there was a, a duet called, there's a dance company called Byra. It's a <laughs> husband and wife. And uh, so I watched all their performances. So they're, they're going through this whole performance. And while I'm sitting there, what I'm thinking of, if I was a non-hearing person and couldn't hear this music, I would understand this. If I because of the uh, visual, because of the visual, and I mm -hmm. was watching it, and I would I saw them move through an entire relationship, and didn't that's what I thought. And then when I interviewed them, that's exactly what they said. It was it's that when they wake up, they might be angry, and they dance from where they are. Mm -hmm. And when she was pregnant, they did the same movement, and it's very physical and athletic. But of course, she had to adapt it. Her son is almost two years old and I met him and you should see the way he expresses. He's, he's very like them, you know? So um, um, I think that artists, wherever you find some, I mean, I have a friend that sh she loves to go walking cause she loves trees and she sees eyes in the trees. And she, so I, I you know, I, I think art is everywhere we we look if we are slow down <laughs> and just breathe it in and enjoy what nature 
shows us. I, I have never seen a blue sky, a color, the, the, the color of the ocean when I go to Negril and I sit on the beach and I see that sky, that, that, that ocean there. I don't know whether there's a box of crayons or any colors in, in, in an artist's palette that can duplicate that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, I mean, I don't think you have to speak. I think it speaks to us and then we speak through it. Well, you said something that totally gets connected now from, at the very beginning about, you know, art is what you see, right? I mean, in, in what I'm hearing more and more is like, it's what you make of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is how one experiences uh, the visual, the musical, uh, or whatever it is that we are talking about. Uh, Gary, do you have any, some words about this, you know, like how we, how we tell stories by doing different media? Oh, of course. I mean, you can definitely look at all the other visual or, or oral forms of communication that definitely provide us with a way of conveying meaning and point of view. Um, when you hear a song that was not written in English and you just hear or the instrumental portion of it, and you can you pick up on the message or the ideas that are being expressed. That's because of the purity of, of the creation of that work, that music. If you are inspired by a Romare Bearden uh, collage or some or a sculpture by Augusta Savage, and that inspires you to create a dance. There's a great power in that, but you have to understand or and give yourself time to really interpret what is going on in that piece. I think a lot of times we don't spend enough, we, our lives are so fast paced that we don't necessarily pay attention to what we are actually being exposed to. And I understand that we get, we get inundated with so much visual, oral, sensory information that you want to try to shut out as much as you can. But I think we lose opportunities for deeper meaning, capturing a better, deeper understanding. Um, because there are people in the world who understand how things are communicated in forms that aren't um, oral, that aren't necessarily just verbal. And they know that they can convey points of view and perspectives to, to an audience that can rile them up and you completely ignore what's going on because you aren't getting it. Um, there, there's a danger in regards to not knowing exactly how, how everything is being presented um, mm -hmm. visually or, or through uh, sound. So I think it's important for us to really be, my, my great grandmother used to have this thing about being being present. She would constantly tell you to be present because because she, she knew I had a tendency to daydream when I was a kid, and it was probably one of the greatest gifts that she was able to give me before she passed was that constant reminder of trying to be there. So you hear what people are saying, really hear what they're saying, so that you don't respond to what you think you heard, or you don't respond to what you think you see but she respond to what actually is there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have been through a few things, right? I mean, so to the audience and to all of us, I think we have established that there are many ways we can tell stories. Uh, I think we have established uh, many ways to think about what art and art practices are. I think we established that storytelling uh, is a very important tool in performance is a very important tool to uh, redress uh, inequities that have been perpetuated against very specific groups, right? Uh, it can be used to uh, tell the story of groups that have not been described. Uh, it can be used to correct stories that have not been told properly uh, and just to, to create visibility for groups of people who have not been talked about. Uh, and I think we have learned so far, and, and that's what, I'm, what I think we, we are going in this direction, is that I heard a lot of, um, we didn't use the terms, but I, I heard that there's a way of uh, conducting oneself 
around the arts and art practices that can be self-healing, that can help mm -hmm. us heal the wounds that we have as individuals. Uh, it can help us in some ways understand better the wounds that other people might be experiencing and, and, and have a better understanding of what it is that they are that they are feeling and perhaps uh, to be used as a form of advocacy or activism so that we can bring people together and then address more structural issues that have been uh, perpetrated against certain groups. And that's where I would like the conversation to, to, to move to this space. But before we do that, I would love to encourage the guests if they want and everybody else just to stretch for a moment, right? I mean, this is like, we've been here for an hour. You can stretch up and down. There's no shame in doing it. We can do a round, you know, this is a Zoom meeting and it's not the same as being in person, right? We are all sitting. I'm sure a lot of people were eating their lunches while we were talking. I ate mine before, so I just, this is not a break. It's just like a continuation, but we are moving as we move through the conversation. Um, so Tori, what might be some thoughts about this idea of self-healing and, 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 and creating the possibility of understanding others and even um, you know, bringing together people for the cause? Well, for me, storytelling, I discovered uh, the storytelling was healing me. Uh, my son died, I mean, my mother died and nine months later, my son died. And after six years of crawling through hell, I was, I had a will to live. And it happened to be in 2011 when Detroit was under emergency management, water shutoffs, all of the oppression and stuff that was coming, that was restricting Detroit. And, but there was some something percolating, Detroit was coming out of it. And I, I felt the same way as Detroit, coming out of something, looking around and there's a lot of destruction and a lot. And I, first I saw uh, graffiti, which, which was a no-no, which was bad, 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 but I lived in a bad neighborhood. I moved to a bad neighborhood because the Wall Street uh, moved me out of my loft and into a basement of a friend's house in Ferndale. And when I got a little 400 bucks I could spend per month. I moved, I moved over by Herm, Herman Kiefer where there was just, I mean, I think 11 people lived on my block and the rest of the houses looked like, it looked like a horror movie. <laughs> uh, the drug dealer across the street was, uh, the, was the policeman of the street, you know, and he helped these old people who couldn't afford uh, pain medicine. He helped them. So I began to see the drug dealer as the same guy up in Troy with the white coat writing prescriptions, you know? So I began to see different things. I'm gonna speak like I speak. You might ask me a question and I'm just, because I feel like I'm in a box. I, so I'm gonna speak like I speak. Um, we like so that. I, it, was, it, was, it was healing me by telling my story. I was telling my story on main stages at the mall. And then I was getting emails from all over the world. Oh, thank you for telling my, my, my. And so grief, I began to delve into grief, which in itself is the way through. He, it's a healing. Grief is a healing. And, and, and so I began to look at what, what is crying. Uh, because when I, 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 I was, when I lived in Toronto, I heard this woman, it was midnight, I was going home, she was dressed up, maybe she was coming from the opera or something, she, she, I could hear her crying, <gasps> and I could hear her kneel, heels clicking, click, 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 <gasps> and it was such a strange sound to me, to hear someone in public crying like that, then I was in Halifax, and this woman, I was on my way to the theater, and she's like, and they fired me, <laughs> And I could hear her crying as I was going this way. I could hear it disappearing. And I was like, how freeing is it to be able to just be you, yourself? You know, you go to, to your job. When I was working in corporate America, eight hours a day, you have to somehow, things happen, shit happens. And then you got to, for whole, eight whole hours, you have to operate under this idea of oppression. You have to be professional, which is another form of oppression as far as I'm concerned as an artist. Mm. Uh, you have to live through that and put everything on hold. So I, 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 they, I invited all of my bosses to my comedy show. 
And I just told them stories about how I felt on the workplace. Next thing I know, they were saying, oh, I understand you better now, Satori, because I would come in with blonde wigs and all, they would, anyway. Uh, then they would ask me to do the pep rallies for the, for the you, job. You, you created an intervention. Yes, because I mean, we're human. I mean, things happen. Your kid, you're worried about your kid. Maybe you can't take all the time off of that pregnancy. Maybe, you know, there are things, we're human. We go to work, we make money, but for that eight whole hours, we're, 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 we're moving through spaces and moods and things that human beings go, move through. So where is it that we can actually have a space to collect ourselves and be more productive wherever we are? So for me, just the sound of crying and clicking heels became, became the genesis of a story. To, mm -hmm. to the ICU of a waiting room is a magical place. It's, it's, a, it's a place where no bullshit, no, there's no small talk in there. We're just a doctor walking up to a couple and watching them collapse because you know their loved one died. To, to, you talk about non-visual story, I mean, you talk about storytelling that's not oral, it's everywhere when you watch people, you watch their body language, you watch their joy or their disappointment, you, you know, watching, you know, it all, everyone is always, already telling a story and, and so either, I want either their own or you're interpreting mm -hmm. I, I I just want to like stress what you just said you know uh I usually what Shatori just described we usually call it improvisation right it's like we go through life as you know we don't know exactly what we are going to do in another five minutes and so I just want to bring the term up for you know for the conversation as we move forward because I think it's also uh, extremely important. Thank you so much for uh, you know it, 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 when everyone is talking about healing and and it, it is described the way you know you just did. Uh, one can see the work right that the person has been done, and so uh, I thank you for letting us see it. Uh, before I go to Gary and ask you the same question that I asked Shatori. Um, I would like for those who are on Zoom to, if they want to, to have a conversation on the chat about the difference between self-care and self-healing. Uh, those are, in my view, very different terms. And if you could just have a conversation there, what does it mean to do self-care and what does it mean to do self-healing? Are they the same, different? They work together? Does one predict the other? Uh, so just, you know, even if it is very short definitions or words, of choice uh, so that you guys can have a more direct uh, participation in the conversation. I think it would be very nice to do that. And thank you so much, Mackenzie, for, for bringing that up. Uh, so Gary, I would love to hear from you. So I'm gonna tell a story, I'm going to tell a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a, a household where my dad had a sixth grade education and um, my mom got a high school degree and very little else. And my father was an alcoholic and a pretty destructive alcoholic. Uh, real abusive to the family. That's the environment I grew up in. And um, two years after I graduated from high school, he died. And we never resolved any of the issues because they were still fresh. I was satisfied with not resolving any of those issues. Uh, and then in 1988, I went to New York to see Fences with the original cast of James Earl Jones and Mary Alice, and Ray Arana, Courtney B. Vance, a Detroiter. Um, and it was at the end of that play when Corey, the son, has come back and he's refusing to go to the funeral of his father, Troy, who was ab abusive emotionally, sometimes physically, had been unfaithful to, to Rose. It was, it was at the end of the play that was the first time I cried for my father and I cried for myself. Because I, I saw that show through the eyes of Corey, the son who had, mm had desired to have a relationship with a father who could help him understand 
what kind of man he wanted to grow into, but couldn't because he was still struggling with issues of his own as an adult. And so the, the pain and anguish of, not, of having that relationship unresolved was finally released. And I tell you, I, I went with a good friend. He can account for this. The last 15 minutes of the play, I can't tell you what the hell happened on the stage because I was just sobbing in the theater. Um, later on in my career, I ended up directing the play. And this time I was older, I was the father of two, I had a stable wife, a family. Um, marriage hadn't been perfect, but, there was, but, but it was stable. And so this time around, when I, did, when I actually directed the play, I experienced it more from the eyes of Troy, somebody who had a great deal of talent and abilities and wanted to actualize it, um, them, but had constraints that existed in the community. Um, was, a, was assertive about his ideals, but sometimes he let those ideals have an impact on his home life or his, or his sense of self. And so I saw the play a lot differently than I had when I originally experienced it. What I'm trying to get at is that art, regardless of where we experience it, it may not be the same experience as we go through our lives because we're not the same person we were 15 years ago or 15 minutes ago. We continue to evolve. And so I can go and have an experience at one age with a work of art, a painting, a musical, a dance. And then I can see it later on. And, be, and because it evokes certain different things in me, it's because I am a different person. My experiences constantly inform what I'm seeing in front of me. And um, I think that's the beauty and the power of the experience. That's one of the ways in which we do all right, we are able to do the healing. And, 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 and what I'm talking about is not nostalgia. I, when, I did the, when I directed that production, I wasn't trying to relive the experience I had in 1988 when I originally saw it. I was actually experiencing it in a different, completely different way because of where I was in my life. We, great art, great art, and I'm not really talking about it in any, other way to define it. Great art has inexhaustibility. And that's really what I'm talking about. Not nostalgia, but the ability to constantly come back and experience a work of art that can sh show us something new, something that we didn't see originally. But again, we have to be open and capable of, ex of interpreting that because it's always been there. We just weren't able to hear it. Making sense? Yeah, very yeah, much I, so. I totally agree with everything you, you just said. You are absolutely uh, correct from my listening of what you just said. Our, 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 our entire lives are a work of art. It's an art, it's a, it's a network and tapestry of the stories that we have interpreted, have told about our lives. That's why I always encourage people to revisit your story, that story you've been dragging around <laughs> about your ex-husband or how your dad was or whatever, look back. Now you're 30, now you're 40. What would you say to the eight-year-old that told that story? What, what would you say? I forgave my uncle out of fences. A brilliant man, a filmmaker, brilliant minister. But when he went out in the world, he was a boy. He was a nigger. So when he, when he came home, he was mad. Don't, he, he used the belt, and I hated him until I saw fences. And then I saw, oh, here's this garbage man. Who, here's this guy that does, where does he get his outlet? I didn't, I, don't cond I didn't condone some of my uncle's behavior, drinking and belts and things like that, but I understood it. And to understand it was freeing myself, healing myself. Talk about self-care, self-healing. To me, healing is an ongoing process. You never stop healing. Because even if you lose a pencil or a favorite necklace, you grieve it. You, you, know, you don't sit down and have an active go to church thing, but you miss it. And so healing is an ongoing, especially when you lose people, lose yourself. Lose, you, then self-care becomes 
the, the, the thing you do to, 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 to heal, to, to actively participate in your own healing. And self-care could be a massage, but for me recent now, self-care is saying no to things that I don't want to do, or I don't have time to do, or I want to do them, but you got to take care of you, you know? So no is a good word. And so is yes, you know, but no is a new word. I, I, I guess all of us used to practice it when we were two years old <laughs> and we need to get back to no. Cause you know, I mean, not like that, but you know, grown up, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that because I mean, you know, even as adults need permission sometimes to, to, to do certain things and no is one of those things that it always feels uh, we need permission uh, to do. Um, uh, thank you so much, both of you, for, for, for sharing those stories, because, I mean, again, nothing does better than a story to make a point, right? Uh, and, and, and so I, I got confirmation from those stories that uh, in creating, you know, art stuff, whatever it is, whatever the art practice is, we can achieve one's own self-healing, right? So like when we, when we are looking at autobiographical work, uh, where we explore different demons that may have been uh, bothering us and then come through it through some self-healing as we create the narrative, uh, as we change the narrative and become more of an authority of our own destiny, right? Our own uh, narrative, which I think is part of what I'm hearing here. And once we are able to do that, we also can be doing this in the company of someone else. Or we can even imagine ourselves in somebody else's shoes, like you described, Gary, as you watching this play, right? Uh, or we can imagine not ourselves in somebody else's shoes, but imagine what it is to be the other person, like Shatori talked about her, her uncle and how she saw some uh, connections between that and the performance of Denzel Washington in Fences, right? I mean, I'm imagining it's the movie you're talking about. Maybe you're talking about the play itself. Well, I, I've seen the play, but I mean, it, was un, it wasn't until that performance. That you actually uh, that realized I, yeah. it. So yeah. I think that that's, you know, what, what the scheme that we have set up in this conversation is about, right? I mean, this idea that we can do a lot of self-healing, help others to heal and use the work of other people to help us move to the next level, which is, okay, now we need to have some action. And the action mm -hmm. may be sometimes mm -hmm. going beyond the self-healing and say, okay, so what can I do to help others heal themselves, to uh, bring a community together, uh, and so on and so forth. And clearly, both of your organizations uh, are trying to do that and succeeding in doing it. Uh, what I would like to do for the next seven minutes or so, which is the time that we have to talk about. Uh, one, I would like to acknowledge all the people who helped us describe self-care and, and self-healing on the chat. I mean, very, you know, incredible, uh, you know, ways of describing those things. Uh, I feel that, you know, we get to know each other much better when you see that. There is no time to be to read all of those things, but we all should. Uh, and I want to acknowledge those who participated in this, you know, small exercise. Uh, but I, I do have a very important question, which is that whenever we talk about self-healing, of course, it applies to every human being, right? Uh, we can be traumatized at many levels as individuals. Uh, and so as individuals, we do all probably need some kind of self-healing uh, or and then self-care as well. But there are some groups that have been structurally repressed. And that's different from healing the self. It's healing a people. It's healing a community. It is healing from wounds that have been uh, inflicted upon an entire groups of people and not necessarily just the individual. And I would like for us to, just to, to, to really distinguish those two things and go back to, to the conversation. Uh, we can concentrate on all kinds of oppressions, right? Uh, all kinds of supremacies, gender supremacy, sexual orientation supremacy. But I would like for us in the few minutes that we have to go back to the idea of white supremacy and what it has done uh, to 
create barriers uh, for black people to achieve what it is that they would achieve as human beings, uh, to take away things from entire groups of people. Um, and how do we, how do we imagine uh, our perception of white supremacy today in terms of storytelling? And what, is, um, what do we envision as the future as we move forward as to use what we know today, particularly as eloquently put by Shatori and Gary, given the, what happened in the past few years. And we have this moment that we are saying a moment of awakening. And I put quotes because, you know, it's different for many different people. But I, I just want to have like, you know, last words from both of you uh, as an opportunity to connect those things together uh, and perhaps clarify anything that you'd like in terms of how you think about racism and white supremacy. So I'm going to start with Gary and then I'm going to go to Shatori. Sure. Well, white supremacy is a narrative as well. It's a false narrative that centers every thing that is vital or important or of value in the capacity of Caucasian people. So if you have a school system that's um, not in that's imbalanced and you're trying to find ways of funding it and you have a property tax, you work it out so that you actually reduce the commitment of property taxes in that community if it's a multiracial community because you're trying to benefit not you're not trying to benefit everybody you're trying to de-invest in the education of everybody's kids you, you advocate for private or charter schools because you think choice is a value when it's not it's really designed to again undervalue the education of a certain group of people mm -hmm. or you do the same in regards to claiming that you're about advancing the interests of women and you have a token few that get in high positions and you disadvantage every, all the rest of them or you say you're inclusive and then people that have different senses of identity different gender definitions aren't able to open. So white supremacy works in a lot of ways. It's a, it's, it's a story that's being told that we have, that we are constantly being fo forced to fed, that we have to actually correct. So I think my, I see my job and one of the reasons why I'm very proud to say we're a black theater company is that the responsibility that I have is to tell African-American stories from an African-American perspective that's unfiltered and uncompromised. Because now more than ever, I feel it's my responsibility to constantly combat that narrative because I don't want white kids growing up as misinformed as their parents are. I think they need to understand exactly that everybody has value and significant importance. And Thank you so much for cutting. Sorry. Thank you so much for connecting back to your organization, right? I mean, which yeah. is what, what yeah. I was looking for as well. Shator, you have about two minutes to do like a, a, a closing. Um, well, I agree that, you know, white supremacy is a big fat lie, uh, but it is the context of our lives. It's a global context and all we are is content producers. All of us are either telling stories about how white supremacy works to our benefit and or demise. White supremacy is a system of advantages. Only goal is to maintain power. It's also a system of oppression for people classified as non-white, which is the strategy to maintain the power. So mm -hmm. everything we see and everything we do is just, that's what I see. That's what, how I understand it. Neely Fuller Jr. said, if you do not understand white supremacy racism, what it is, how it works, everything else you do understand will only confuse you. So when we're confused by what we see, it's only, it's, it's, it's an expression that we are operating inside of white supremacy. How do we find ourselves out of that? It's a moment to moment. It's a moment to moment freedom. You have to dismantle the chip, which is telling you how to behave, what to say, what not to say, how to manage yourself, 
and it's unconscious in a lot of ways, but it validates and perpetuates that system. So once you see it and you dismantle it, then you have to move, a, 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 you know, because you might lose. Hey, you might not get that job, Black girl, if you say what you really want to say. Mm. So you have to go out and test it. If I say what I really want to say, will I lose that job? What I'm finding is when I say what there is to say, people go, oh, really? Oh, let's try that. You know, it's like, because I think everybody understands that white supremacy does benefit white people the most, but it also disadvantages white people. But white people get to go, hey, y'all, you, you're messing with me. You know, Tea Party gets you messing with me. And then, oh, oh, y'all noisy? Here's some stuff. And, and that, but we're not going to give it to people, not, you know, people of color, we'll give it to, to some immigrants. And the reason why I think immigrants come to the country, they say, well, how can you, you're, you're black, you're Nigerian, you come to this country, why are you, you must be lazy. But when I go to a new country to live or a new state to live, the first thing I do, I know I don't know anything. So I find out where everything is. Where, where can I find out about this? Where are the artists? So I'm on, I'm on this conscious search to empower myself and to, to you know, integrate myself into community. And at, with Black people, we, we, we have a whole different education system, whole miseducation system. And white people have been miseducated too. We talk about critical race theory. Can we have some, please? We never have had it. So you're talking about, oh, we don't want to be taught this in the schools. We never were taught that in the schools, you know, and we're never going to be taught that in schools that are white supremacist schools. So we have to go to Plowshares Theater. You have to come to the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers, where we do have people who are Egyptian telling their stories in their accents, do have Filipino lesbian woman struggling with what to do with Jesus create a song in her own language. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested in human being and how we can connect that and how we can heal community together and to, and, and to embrace the wonder, the magnificence that we all are. But we all have to understand that we're being used. And as an artist, I don't like that. I like, I, 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 there's a whole nother world I see. So that's what Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers is um, committed to do. That's our mission globally. And, uh, and I will end there. I will say I will end there, but I'm not complete. My story is still going, as is yours. Well, if, if, if you know, I learned a lot of things between the two of you, but one thing that I, I did learn is that both of you open up you know, Pandora boxes <laughs> where there's a lot to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can... I, I, I can have a whole list of topics that we could go off on and, and have like long conversations about, uh, which I am going to be sending emails to both of you. And I'm going to ask to have the privilege of being with you, you know, separately at some point so that we can talk about and get to know each other a little better, uh, if it is okay. Uh, I would love to thank both of you for really an incredible uh, conversation, one uh, that we desperately need in the School of Social Work and, and elsewhere. Um, I, I believe that the, the leadership of Engage will be sending to all attendants information about the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers uh, and Plowshares Theater. We should always join and enjoy uh, and, 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 and do stuff with them. Um, I, uh, I will end by saying that a lot of the things that I, that I heard really spoke to me at a level that I have learned, you know, from growing up, which is the idea of critical consciousness. I heard that in, in how you guys talked about these things over and over again, like developing, developing critical consciousness, uh, in a way that allows us to see what's happening around us and then create the narrative that is true based on our realities. Uh, and so it's a very Brazilian thing because the guy who coined the term critical consciousness is a Brazilian uh, educator and you know I, I am a fan. And so um, I'll just end with the idea of critical consciousness, which is what we try to address and grow through the art collective that we have been creating slowly uh, in the School of Social Work as, as really the core of what it is we are trying to do there. Uh, and having said so, I will then 
give the mic back to my phenomenal uh, colleague. Where is she? I'm looking for you, Trina. Uh, Trina Shanks, who will then close uh, the program for the day. But before we do so, uh, you know, a big you know, round of applause to our guests, you know, and much love to them uh, for being here with us uh, and, and being so fabulous. Thank you very much. Wow, I felt like I got to sit in on some, some intense, intimate conversation. So thank you, Rogerio, for moderating, Gary and Satori for coming. Um, I, I thank everyone who continued to stay on. We still have almost the same amount we had at the beginning because it's such a great conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. For students who are part of the engaged community and panelists, please stay on for a few more minutes to have a debrief. Um, if someone from the engaged team could put a link to our engaged webpage to show where you can see this and other um, engaged conversations. Again, if you want to look at the recording, um, this is our last um, webinar of this semester, but look out for our fall virtual series. Um, we'll release the information in the summer. Um, and I think with that, we are done. Um, I know that um, Aisha will be sending out any information, resources, um, follow-up that you guys might have, but that's all I got. So um, <laughs> thanks for joining us. And those who aren't in the class can sign off. 